of order. If, if everybody's ready. Public meeting of the Transit Service Delivery Advisory Committee to order. And uh, I'm John McGlennon, I'm the chair of the DISDAC and uh, member of the James County Board of Supervisors representing the Association of Counties. Uh, to Cindy. Good morning, everyone. Cindy Mester, Deputy City Manager for the City of Falls Church, uh, Vice Chair of this fine group, and representing DML. Well, I'm, I'm actually a staff member, Zach Trogdon, with the RPT. I'm someone who's the Chief of Public Transportation. I can get my seat over there because I'm another staff member. <laughs> <laughs> and we're glad to have you here, Zach. Uh, uh, welcome. Congratulations on your appointment. Thank you. Hopefully it's a big hole at Delwada, but <laughs> I'll fill it very well. That's right. I'll um, keep So Kate Matthijs uh, with the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, um, here representing the Virginia Transit Association. Jamie Jackson, Fredericksburg Regional Transit, representing DRPT. Sam Stink with GRTC, representing VTA. Should we continue with the numbers? Excuse me, I'll hit that. I'm Dan Sonnenkar. I'm a statewide transit planning manager with the RPT. Director of Statewide Transit Programs for DRPT. Uh, Jim Dyke from Northern Virginia. I think I'm representing the DRPT. <laughs> 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 it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't we all? Is this the Board of Education? How do I Good morning, everyone. Uh, Grant Sparks. I'm the director of transit planning. Great. Thank you all for being here this morning, and thank you for the uh, great way to start uh, our, our morning. Uh, folks, I don't have to leave pretty early, get on the road, uh, but uh, nice reward breaking the for you when we got here. Uh, Grant, I think we turn it over to you now for a recap. Sure. Um, so I think you guys already saw the agenda. Don't need to do that. Um, well, I guess I should mention after I go and Andy goes and Dan goes, we will have just a general open discussion about any of the items that we uh, reviewed. We do need to do a public hearing today. Um, so we'll open that up for public comment. Um, I think we do have uh, some on the line. Um, and then at the very end, we'll discuss next steps, potentially our next DISBAC meeting. So, um, starting us off with uh, the TISDAC recommendations from last year, uh, first I just wanted to thank you all again for all the hard work that you guys put in uh, last year. I think we had either five or six meetings that we convened, uh, all of them were half-day sessions and we got pretty deep into the weeds, but I think we, we came out pretty well. Um, all of the recommendations that TISDAC um, uh, provided to the PTB were all Approved. Um, so I'm just going to review what was done last year. So starting us off uh, with the capital assistance prioritization through merit, um, this is where we started our discussion last year. Um, TISDAC recommended a handful of changes to the CTB policy for capital assistance. Um, so I'm going to quickly just review those. Um, starting with the first one, provide incentives for transit agencies to seek federal discretionary funding. We had a good conversation about how historically, as a whole, Virginia um, had not been very competitive under these federal discretionary programs. We also talked about IIJA and Bill and how there's a lot more federal discretionary funding out there for transit, and we needed to find ways to incentivize our transit agencies to apply for that funding. Uh, so one of the things that we added into the CTB policy was the ability for DRPT to lower the local match requirement for any projects that were successful under those federal discretionary programs. Um, so those programs are actually available right now. Um, so this will be the first year that we get to see whether or not um, uh, our agencies can take advantage of that lower, uh, local match requirement. Number two here, uh, update scoring methodology to allow for just-in-time delivery of replacement vehicles and other assets. Um, as you might recall, our, our uh, previous policy and the way that we scored started awarding points to replacement vehicles right as the vehicle was uh, um, meeting its useful life. 
that was not incorporating the delivery time window, which could be up to two or three years. So we changed the policy so that we would start awarding points to those replacement vehicles about 80% into its useful life. So that way, when the when we are awarding the funding and the vehicle is finally, finally delivered, it, it aligns with it meeting its useful life. The third point here, um, update scoring methodology to include more project categories, uh, allowing DRPC to differentiate more between certain project types. Um, this is more of a technical thing. Um, our scoring, the way it worked was, it, it just led to a lot of lumpiness in the scores, and so it was really hard for DRPT to find a good drawing the line uh, um, threshold of what to fund and what not to fund. So adding in more project categories allowed us to differentiate on our prioritization list, um, and it, it just allows us to um, set a better threshold um, for scoring and, and funding. Um, number four here, add an incentive scoring category, uh, which will reward projects that achieve statewide priority goals. Um, so this was essentially uh, awarding bonus points to agencies that uh, met certain criteria. Um, Dan, help me out here if I miss some. Uh, the incentive scoring um, uh, uh, areas were uh, submitting performance data on time. Uh, updating TransAm, which is our vehicle uh, asset um, or just asset management uh, inventory, uh, doing that on time, uh, submitting five-year capital budgets to DRPT on time, making sure that transit development and transit strategic plans were up to date, and then I think I'm missing one other one, the fifth. TransAm. I said TransAm. Or maybe it's just four. No, I think it's just, it's four in the agency accountability, but there's also three other criteria areas of electric vehicles, uh, innovations, things like uh, mobile ticketing and uh, real-time arrival and departure information, <coughs> safety and comfort around uh, transit facilities mm -hmm. for passengers, yep. so shelters and things like that. So we, we've incorporated those uh, incentive points uh, for FY24 um, as we're working through the scoring. And then the last one here, update scoring methodology for major expansion projects to simplify and streamline the scoring process. Um, so as you might remember, the major expansion uh, scoring kind of mimics smart scale in a way where we uh, had different factors weighted differently um, based on uh, the geography of the project. And we did some sensitivity analysis and realized that that wasn't really making a big impact on the project score. So we really thought that instead of spending a whole lot of time going through all these numbers, that it would just simplify the process, getting rid of that geographic uh, requirement. So, um, so that was the fifth one. Um, I guess before I move on to transit strategic plans, um, any questions about capital stuff from last year? All right, moving right along. Um, transit strategic plan guidelines, we didn't spend a whole lot of time here, uh, certainly still important, um, but not many recommendations. Um, the CTB did approve uh, two specific recommendations coming from TISDAC. The first one was to modify the transit strategic plan annual update process from a letter submission to a joint quarterly meeting. So previously, every transit agency uh, um, in, in the Commonwealth uh, that was subject to uh, transit strategic plan guidelines had to submit a, an annual letter to DRPT to basically show what they plan to uh, apply for in the coming year. Um, that was a planning requirement. Um, we felt that that was more of a checkbox and wasn't really leading to good dialogue between staff and the transit agencies on what their, uh, what their needs are. So we recommended to do a joint quarterly meeting instead, bring the planners and the program managers to the transit agencies um, once a year and basically have this dialogue back and forth and we thought that this would be more valuable. So, um, so that was the first one. And then the second one was to modify the five-year review from a major update to a minor update. And uh, in lockstep with this, we also made the major update every 10 years. So um, previously, each agency had to complete a brand new transit strategic plan every five years. Um, and we moved that basically back to 10 years with a, a five-year minor update. 
these these plans are, have we've seen have been fairly expensive and, and, and time consuming. Um, and so we didn't think that a whole lot would change in a five year uh, window. We thought that it was still necessary to have a minor update at the five year point, but not to start from scratch and do a whole new plan every five years. So that's why we recommended uh, shifting that back to 10 years. Plus, there are any questions on those? Yes. Have those quarterly me meetings started yet? Yeah. yeah, so so when CTB approved these changes, uh, I think it was October when they approved, um, and we were just getting ready for the uh, new grant cycle to open. And so we actually did do two pilots. I think it was two. Um, I could be wrong. I believe it was Lynchburg and maybe Dash. We did... Um, uh, uh, a joint quarterly meeting with them, um, and from what I've heard, it's been, it, it was it was very uh, successful. We had a really good conversation with those agencies. So, um, but we do plan on rolling it out to all the agencies this uh, this calendar year. And then, last but not least, uh, the merit operating assistance formula. Um, TISAC unanimously uh, voted to make no changes uh, to the operating assistance formula, but uh, the group did commit to reconvening in the spring of 2023, so here we are, uh, to revisit this program. Um, some key takeaways from uh, those discussions, uh, starting with the top one, there was a general consensus from the group that the operating assistance formula is functioning as intended. It's rewarding agencies for better performance, <laughs> higher ridership, and then not rewarding agencies that are, are seeing ridership decline. Um, on the second point here, this was we spent a whole lot of time on this, was we had a, a robust discussion regarding transit agencies that were project, projected to see a decrease in FY24 operating assistance funding compared to FY21 levels. And this is where it got kind of complicated because we, we mentioned to the group that we had really only run the formula as intended once, and it was in FY21. FY20, we had some transition assistance as we were moving into the new merit operating formula, so we helped some agencies out as they were tra transitioning. FY21, we had a normal formula run, and then in FY22 and FY23, we had all of this uplift funding, and basically we brought every single transit agency in Virginia up to their 30% operating cap. So it wasn't really a, a full run of the formula because it was just 30% of their operating expenses um, we were able to uh, provide assistance for. So, uh, so that's why we were comparing to FY21. We also talked a whole lot about um, our projected allocations uh, for this coming year, FY24. Uh, we identified a handful of agencies that we were projecting to see significant decreases in uh, operating funding compared to FY21, the big one being VRE. Um, we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But then there were also a handful of other agencies that we were projecting to see uh, decreases, including GLTC, uh, Radar in the Roanoke area. Um, Loudoun. Loudoun County was, was another one, and I think those were the three three big ones. There were some very small uh, decreases as well, Farmville being one, um, but those were, the, those were the big ones that we spent a whole lot of time talking about. So again, we later on in this presentation, Dan's going to do uh, an update of those projections, and Andy's going to talk about um, some legislative changes, um, uh, but before I turn it over to Andy, um, any questions about the work that was done last year? All right, and I think Dr. Smoot is actually on the line. I'm sorry, I probably should have mentioned. Uh, I don't think he had a chance to introduce himself. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being with us this morning. Glad to be here. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Chair, Director DeBull, members of the committee. It's time for our annual, my annual visit with you all to talk about the General Assembly. Um, and we had a significant piece of legislation this year that the RPT was advocating on behalf, and it was making changes to the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund um, as it relates to the distribution of funding to the Virginia Railway Express, VRE. 
and it also made some additional oversight requirements from the CTB to VRE and WMATA. So just some background, this is all old school information for you all, you all know, but the current distribution of the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund operating is 27%, capital um, 18, in BTC, WMATA 46.5, TRIP is 6, special 2.5, then you have those four items coming off the top, including DRPD's administrative costs. Um, just as a comparison, before I go to the next slide, um, FY21, VRE received $13.4 million in operating assistance and capital projects. Why am I comparing them to FY21? Same reason that Grant gave a few minutes ago, 22-23. We had the influx of additional funds and not a really good comparison here. So how is the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund going to be moving forward? Um, what we've done is we've reduced operating um, by 2%, um, and we have reduced capital by a percent and a half. Excuse me, that two, excuse me, two and a half for operating and 1% for capital, thanks to that. And we have shifted that over to create a separate category for Virginia Railway Express up to 3.5% annual rate. So VRE will no longer be eligible to receive funding from the operating and capital pot of funds. Um, they will have that up to 3.5%, and DRP, um, CTB and DRPT will determine the exact share by using performance-based metrics that are specific to commuter rail. Um, as you all know, you all were a part of the discussion, VRE has expressed concerns in the past that they're at a disadvantage um, with the current operating performance metrics being more bus centric. So this pulls them out of operating and capital and gives them their own pot of fund of up to 3.5%. Um, the key is up to 3.5%. So technically, CTV could say we're only going to give them 3.3%. So what happens to that 0.2? They'll be put back into the statewide capital program um, for use by the other transit agencies. These new percentages will not go into effect this current FY cycle. They're going to effect with the FY 2025 SIP. The reason why we're currently working on the SIP right now, we're still waiting for this bill to be signed by the governor. We didn't want to deal with the uncertainty, so we just decided to do a one-year grace period. So how much money does this work out for VRE? These are the maximum allocations of up to 3.5%, and these are based on the December 2022 revenue forecast. So in FY25, we're looking at 16.3, and with the growth of the fund, we're looking at 17.6 million um, in FY29. So I mentioned oversight requirements. We're adding an additional oversight requirement for VRE. Um, they're going to be required to submit their operating budget and proposed capital expenditures to CTB by February 1st annually. Um, and the board may withhold 20% if the URE fails to do this. This is a very similar requirement that the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority has to do every year. Um, that's where we took the language from. The URE will have to do this this coming year. So by February 1, 2024, they will have to submit their budget to CTB. No action, no approval needed from the CTB. This has to be submitted. Um, so let's talk a little bit about WMATA. Um, the bill does not change the current 46.5 distribution to NBTC for WMATA. Um, however, the bill now does say that the Commonwealth share of the WMATA operating and capital subsidy for Virginia, the Commonwealth will contribute no more than 50% of that. NBTC will have to provide at least the other 50%. Um, this is usually the case in most years. The only year um, that this is a never, that Virginia has given more than 50% is the year where we had the uplifts. Um, again, if for some reason the 46.5 grows more than the 50%, excess funds will be redistributed to the statewide capital program. On the next bullet, um, some additional withholding requirements for NDTC WMATA. Uh, WMATA will have to submit their budget and capital expenditures to CTV by April 1st. Um, and then the WMATA GM and the Commonwealth and the NDTC representatives to the WMATA board 
will have to come and address the CTB annually. Our failure to do so in either case will lead to CDB withholding 20% of the funding. Um, the last bullet, um, <coughs> um, this specifies what is required in WMATA's strategic plan every year. Uh, we just took the requirements for the urban transit agencies, what they're required to have in their strategic plan, and now say that WMATA has to do the same thing. So what WADA has to do, what Blacksburg Transit has to do, now WADA has to do the same thing in their strategic plan. Um, and then another piece of legislation, just real quickly, um, Senate Bill 1326, House Bill 2338, makes changes to the Transit Ridership Incentive Program. This was a legislation that originated with Virginia Transit Association, uh, coming out of the V-Team study that we did here at the RPT. Um, it creates a new category of programs that are eligible for funding through TRIP, um, those being um, improvements to bus shelters and improvements for the transition to electric buses, whether that's the buses itself or the infrastructure. Um, happy to answer any questions. I can do the question. Is it specific electric bus or zero emission bus? I guess that's electric. Just good to know. That it's specific to electric? I think it's just for the transition to electrification. Okay. Because that was something that was in specifically in the equity and modernization yeah. study. Perfect. And that can be the electric buses itself, it can be the charging station, there's also we've been talking about it could be for planning to make the transition. Yes, sir. How does the up to thirty percent affect the distribution of the other two components, the regional connectivity and yeah, this gets a little complicated because we have like two different versions of the same code section right now. There's a sunset clause. So through July 1 of 2024, the language says that um, at least 75% um, can be spent um, for regional connectivity. Um, at least 25% can be spent for low-income programs. And now we will say no more than 30% for this new category. After July 1, we go back to no more than 25% for low income, no more than 30% for this new program, and at least 75% for. The math doesn't work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. so. so, what we're what we're planning to do for all of these legislative changes is. You know, we have an existing board policy for WMATA, for the dedicated capital funding for WMATA. Uh, so we're going to go back and modify that to add a, additional language to implement these legislative requirements. We would need to develop a new board policy for the management of that DRE portion of the program and how the, what the metrics would be and how that would be managed. And then we also, I'm going to forget something, we also need to go back and modify the TRIP program policy that the CTB has to, at least from a CTB policy perspective, clarify how they're going to interpret the code and how we're going to implement that, you know, additional eligibility in the TRIP program. And so the intent is to try to take those as a workshop item this summer with the board, probably July, and then, um, take that back to the CTB for action in September so that we can implement all of that with the, what would then be the fiscal year 25 six year program. Trying to thread that in around the board, the CTB's schedule or travel six year program, all of the work that's going on with smart scale VTRANS and everything else, we're trying to thread a needle and not get wrapped up in some of those other discussions. And I think that's gonna be July. Go ahead and take that, take care of that. Quick note, um, we got a lot of folks listening in, and have, they have all confirmed that the bill language says zero emission oh, bus fleet. Yeah, which is helpful because I know we're looking sort of hydrogen, yeah, technology agnostic. Also, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm wrong, we have a hydrogen fuel cell yes. bus on our state contract. Yes, yeah. so, so yes. we don't want to limit. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Is this an appropriate time to raise the question about VRE? I, th I think so, Dr. Smoot. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
where's the ridership of VRE compared to pre-pandemic? I know there's been some recovery going on. Where are we on that? Dan, do you want, I mean, we, we, Dr. Smith, we put that in the director's report to the CTB this month. I, if I recall correctly, it was something between five and during the pre-pandemic and increasing gradually um, in the report from last month. But Dan, do you? Yeah, I, well, I think what we're seeing is an average of somewhere in the high 30% range of what it used to be. Yeah. Getting up. Excuse me, it's, it's back to what? Uh, uh, upper 30%, 40%. Yeah, okay, pandemic. yeah, that, that's what I thought I recall. Uh, is, is the federal government still not back to work in the office? It, there is no requirement from the Office of Personnel Management that federal employees come into the office a certain amount of time per week. It's up to each individual agency to establish what their um, telework policy and return to return to the office policy is going to be. And do you think that continues to have a major impact on VRE ridership? Absolutely. Well, you know, I, 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 I'm very supportive of VRE, but I'm also very supportive of allocating transit dollars where uh, it's addressing the need to move people. And uh, I, I have some concern that uh, we may have a budget issue booming, uh, not not tomorrow, but out in the future sometime. If this ridership does not significantly improve, and I, I frankly would send the federal government a bill. Well, Dr. Smoot, I mean, I, I will I will change hats for a moment and put on my hat as the chair of the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority Board and say that you know VRE is a great partner with with us on the Transforming Rail in Virginia initiative. We are working with them on some long-term ridership recovery plans that, you know, quite frankly, our, our work in the um, in the rail corridor and separating passenger rail from the freight, uh, the Swan Bridge and other projects, is gonna enable them to have much more flexibility in terms of slots and service times that, you know, much like our bus systems have been able to do, the ones that have been most successful in recovering from the pandemic are the ones that have been able to shift how they operate to meet new ways that people travel, not just focused on getting to work in the morning and getting home in the evening. And so we are actively working with VRE on that front to uh, work with CSX and Norfolk Southern on, on potentially some changes to slots and times and days of week of operations. Uh, as we continue to move forward with the um, I-95 uh, and, and Western Rail Quarter um, programs on the rail side that I, I think will, will help. So I, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that we're kind of just waiting and uh, wait. we don't have a wait and see uh, attitude about this. We're actively out there trying to help bring folks back to rail because quite frankly, we need DRE to be successful from, con from a congestion management perspective on Interstate 95. We did a lot of work a couple of years ago on the 95 quarter. It cost upwards of $12 billion to add a lane, uh, you know, a lane to the interstate and it would be full in less than 10 years. So we need, you know, we need options and VRE is a big part of that solution. And so we're doing everything that we can. Andy and his team are working with VRE on some marketing initiatives uh, as well. So, I mean, we're, we're going at this with, uh, from all fronts, and uh, VRE is an excellent partner for us, and, and uh, both DRPT and VPRA are, are working with them to help them be successful and, and recover well. Thank you. Please continue to keep us posted. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I suppose not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, excuse me. Good morning, everybody. Um, I feel like we're uh, we're back here quicker than uh, than I had imagined being. I could talk about operating again. So, um, over the next few slides, I'm just going to review our FY24 still projected allocation for operating systems throughout the state. Uh, throughout the state, rather. Um, uh, we updated this in anticipation of this meeting with some new data. 
Um, and so I'm going to go over what we did last time, what we will have in the eventual um, actual allocation, and what we're looking at right now. Unfortunately, it's still moving. And I will repeat that <laughs> over and over. These, these are not even, I, I would even tell these preliminary everything. <laughs> preliminary everything. And so you see it's printed. All right. So as a reminder here, I wanted to quickly go over some of the data limitations that we faced back in the spring last year when we ran these uh, scenarios for you all. Uh, since some of those data assumptions that we made do limit the accuracy of the projection. So the assumptions that we made are, are listed here at the top. Uh, we, we had to extrapolate FY22 transit agency performance data for three months because we were still in that performance year. And so uh, we, we used a best, a best guess kind of uh, approach to projecting that forward. Um, and I'm happy to report that we've actually looked back at it and we were quite close. So um, I, I had a lot of faith in, in, in the, uh, the methods that we use, but it does limit, it was slightly different um, than, than the actual reported numbers. Uh, in addition, we used FY21 audited expenses in that version of the projection. Um, and that was because those were the re most recent audited expenses available at the time. Um, and finally, we had to rely on the projected FY24 overall DRPP operating systems revenues that were included in the FY23 last year's six-year plan. So that's a whole year and a half almost out from when the actual allocation happens, and so those do change over time. Generally, from what I've seen, they increase, but sometimes they decrease, so that's a limitation as well. In reality, what's going to happen is um, the formula for FY24 will use the data listed below. So it's going to include the FY22 audited transit agency uh, performance data, which we have. Uh, it's going to use the FY22 audited financials for each transit agency, which we are still in the process of reviewing. And it's going to use the actual FY24 overall DRPT operating allocation that we get. Um, and so we still have projections for that. They still are kind of worked out in the spring as we move towards the uh, SIP approval. Um, but yeah, that's what we will ultimately get to. And so what we have now is kind of something in between, but it's a much better picture than what we were getting last year. So um, our finance division is putting finishing touches right now on, on doing the FY22 audited expense reports. And so we don't quite have that data to incorporate into this projection now. So uh, we will still be relying on um, the second bullet here on the FY21 expenses in this because those FY22 numbers are simply just not available. They will over the next, they'll be over the next few weeks and we'll have a much better picture of what the actual allocation will look like. Um, in addition, uh, uh, we, in this one, we, we have updated our FY24 overall DRPT revenues for, for operating. Uh, we have a uh, updated projection as of December of last year, which is uh, much more accurate and it's got some more money in it, which we'll see in, in, in a moment. Okay, can I stop you there? Yeah, please. So we will get another revenue forecast at some point, but we usually get one somewhere between the draft and final program. Uh, but the General Assembly left without adopting a full update of the budget I and mean, we are in in the middle of the budget cycle which this wasn't a budget year so there is some thought that we are going to see something more um but anyway there's a lot of things that are still up in the air from a budget perspective so take everything with a grain of salt these are december revenue projections which is what we have shared um you know from a top line perspective with the Commonwealth transportation board uh that we will you always see another set of revenue projections to finalize the program. There's a lot. There's just, just, just a lot of Thank you. Sorry. No, no. That's great. Um, so, uh, in addition to uh, ridership hours and miles that we are using in, in this version of the projection are the accurate ones that we will be using for the actual allocation. So that's an FY18, 19, 21, and 22 ridership hours and miles. And the reason why we're not using FY20 is because that was the COVID year, and uh, we don't have um, audit expenses from that year in the same sense that we do every year. We did not run our um, And so, and then for PMT, for the commuter rail sizing piece of this, we have the actual FY30 for that year. Okay? Um, 
Okay, so here's what we're looking at now. And Dan, actually, before you uh, slide, just real quick, mm -hmm. on the second bullet point, so as, as I think you guys all know, the expenses for sizing and performance really drive the formula. And so using the 21 for this projection that Dan's about to show and not the 22, it does not incorporate changes to, you know, if an agency grew or retracted between FY21 and 22. If they incurred more expenses, especially some of the larger transit agencies like HRT, GRTC, that will change how everything then trickles down. So until our finance finishes those 22 financials, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, we're getting close. So. But the general parameters of this won't shift that much, but still a projection. All right, so here's what we're looking at now. So um, once the audits are complete, like Grant said, uh, this will impact various pieces of this, but specifically it would uh, increase or decrease that the, the little red ticks on here, which are the 30% tax on the agencies. It can also, of course, influence the sizing metrics and the performance metrics that go into it. And so there could be fluctuations up and down for the, the, the major moving bars here. That is the actual projected allocation that we're looking at. Uh, so the first thing I want to direct your attention to here is the total funding available at just over $132 million. Uh, this is significantly higher than what we saw last spring. We were looking at around $114 million. It's just because we have updated budget projections that are uh, going to, uh, to our agencies in this case. Um, taking this into account and accounting for the updated uh, performance metrics, like I said, the blue bars here uh, illustrate the F1 24 allocations, projected allocations for the largest agencies in the state. The next slide is the smaller agencies in the state. Um, so again, we're comparing to FY21, which is illustrated in orange, since that was the last year that we really ran the formula as intended. FY22 and 23, we were able to give everybody 30%. So um, the increased revenue projections means that almost everybody, unless they were already hitting their 30% cap, uh, will receive a higher percentage of their operating expenses than we were projecting last spring. So also what you'll notice in here is that many more of these agencies are hitting that 30% cap because we have no money in the program. Um, those that do not are all receiving a higher percentage than previously projected as well. So those agencies that we had projected back in, in April and May to receive significantly less than FY21 uh, are still projected to receive less than 21, but uh, they will receive slightly higher than we were projecting then. So VRE, um, the reduction projected here is, is to be about 49% less than what uh, they saw in FY21. That compares to what we were projecting in the spring of 59% less, okay? So Loudon also is 17% less. We were, we were projecting in the spring 29% less. And GLTC is 21% less than FY21, which compares to 37% less. Back in the spring. I know that's a lot of percentages and a lot of differences, but all this to say is that all of the decreases have improved. Okay? So the same story exists for the smaller agencies. Okay? The general trend is the same here. Um, uh, the grand majority of these agencies are now able to hit their 30% cap simply because their operating budgets are much lower than those, than those uh, larger agencies. Um, and those that were projected to receive less than FY21 in the spring will generally fail, fare better here, with the exception of one agency, and I'll explain why. So radar is projected to receive 6% less than FY21 here. Back in the spring, we were saying that they would receive 24% less, so they're even significantly better. Uh, Farmville is still projected to receive 9% less, but it's because in the spring they were already hitting their 30% cap, and so they continue to hit their 30% cap here. So that's kind of the dynamics of this, and we, I'm sure this is all kind of familiar to you, or it's coming back in, <laughs> at least. Um, but so the increase in, the, in that, in that um, uh, forecasted amount of money that we have for this program is really helping everybody kind of lift up a bit. So, Can I look at this? Yeah, please. About uh, the source of, of the increase uh, and what we anticipate going forward. Uh, so the source of the increase, I can't really speak to. It's it, it's what we've received in the projection. I don't know if Jen or Yeah, you can thank you. Wear my acting CFO hat. Um, a lot of <laughs> uh, so it's it's 
the overall increase in the Commonwealth Transportation Fund. All of the funds that are collected for transportation across the Commonwealth, it's gas tax, it's portion of sales tax, motor vehicle sales and use tax, all of those, we've seen just an overall increase in revenues in the transportation program. And then our share from the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund benefits from that. So this, the offering is one. But it's not an anomalous kind of uh, situation. No, it, it's not. And I mean, I think we, we've looked at the last two, uh, so 20, 22 and 23, we saw as an anomaly. And we had some CTB directed one time revenues off of the top of the CTF that came to Mass Transit. Um, as part of that, we had COVID relief money. So we saw this bubble in revenues. I think what we're seeing now is the bubble's not, the, the drop in the bubble is not as significant as we thought it was going to be, and it's kind of leveling off, and the projections are that it's going to kind of continue. Um, what, we, what was presented to the Commonwealth Transportation Board back in uh, December, January, for the Commonwealth Transportation Fund kind of maintains that level of funding. <coughs> And if I can just quickly add, one of the anomalies with FY24, that $132 million in total operating assistance funding, again, that's just projected right now, but that is probably not the new normal level um, because typically, like in FY21, for example, when we ran the formula as intended, we had um, operating revenue and we distributed it out and you know it worked as intended. In FY22, we brought everybody up to the cap, and so we actually weren't able to give out all of our operating assistance funding. We had a carryover balance, which we've never had before. And so in 22, we carried over some into 23. In 23, we brought everybody up to their 30% cap as well, and so the carryover piled up, and now we're finally dumping the carryover into the 24 program. And so in 25, what we're looking at is we're probably going to dip back down. But not as much as we thought. But not as much as we thought. Um, so being aware of that carryover, just that, that new norm, this is not the new normal. Yeah, so, Mr. Chair, right. one of the things, though, um, that my expectation is in 2020, we had a complete restructuring and a spreading out of revenues for the Commonwealth Transportation Fund. And a big part of that effort was developing a more sustainable and growing pot of funding for all transportation, I'd like to think, we are finally seeing the results of that. And so um, it's really hard to think that bill was um, passed two days before the world shut down, because that was that famous week in March, we all remember very well. But I think it's important to look forward. That legislation was huge in the ability to provide that sustainable funding that we're seeing now. So, of course, we have weird anomalies, but it's structured, and it's also structured in a way that um, that transits not a small number of revenues. It's a whole bunch of different ones as a diversification. Anyway, so I just think that that thoughts have forgotten the, the monumental impact of that 2020 legislation, omnibus legislation, because it kind of got caught up in the in COVID stuff. But you know, that really, I think, sets us up on a good path moving forward. That is a fantastic point. And, and yeah, it protected us. I mean, we could see years where the transit funds would go down, but the highway funds would go mm -hmm. up. And now we all, like, yeah. it's, it's the same for everybody. And so that's a great point. Yeah. If I understand it, um, there is an anomalous aspect to this um, because of the carryovers that are being uh, utilized now. But. but that if we are operating at a higher base. Yeah. Not, a, not a probably 79 or 80%. But it's also dollars. growing, and I think that's million. the key thing. It's $11 million, I think, was our carryover. And, Chair, then, then we, we had that good news, and then we had the half-cent loss of the grocery sales tax last year, So then, and the carryover. So how does that kind of play in still growth? We're still seeing growth, even with yeah. the change in the grocery tax, and that's all been in the lean here, so it's kind of projection. What is not in these forecasts is anything that was not factored in to the governor's introduced budget in December. So any changes as a result of general assembly action that would change revenues mm -hmm. has been accounted for. And of course, his introduced budget took into account all the tax cuts, so right. depending what the Senate and the House negotiate. Exactly. 
so the projections were, were, were higher than what we were working with in the spring either way. It was around $121 million, and then we have this additional carryover that we put into that. And what do you project, this projection, the revenue would be without the carryover? One, $121 million. Okay. Yeah. 21, okay. Let's get my... Mindset to a dollar. Yeah. Case point back where the omnibus still our mm -hmm. operating program is about a hundred million dollars a year, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. So I mean even without the carryover we we've, we've seen we've seen different angles. Good. That's helpful to Okay. Thank you. So moving on, this is the same data in scatter plot format. Um and so, I mean, what you see here is VRE is still the outlier to the left um, in, the, in the negative column. Um, Loudoun and GLCC have moved much closer to being into the, almost into the positive quadrants. And then the big winners as far as uh, increases in percentages and dollars are our largest Virginia agencies, HRT, GLCC, and so So this last slide just kind of um, breaks down a little bit and unpacks a little more about what's going on with the projected reductions. Also highlights uh, why those reductions are occurring and what we're doing to address them. Um, so the first one with VRE, um, we are projecting in this version of our FY24 projection a 49% decrease compared to FY21. Um, that was due to ridership and TMT decreasing substantially during the pandemic and that recovery being uh, quite slow to return to normal levels. Um, but to note here, as we just talked about with Andy, just the General Assembly passed legislation um, that will take uh, VRE out of the VFPC merit capital and operating programs and address that issue going forward. Uh, Loudoun County, we are projecting to see a 17% decrease compared to FY21. Uh, the county discontinued many of their long-haul commuter routes during the pandemic, and uh, some of them have still not, or really never got re-implemented, and now they've launched a new service that's more oriented towards the, uh, the Silver Line and having metro service out there. So uh, in FY23, VRPP awarded them with a trip grant to support the costs associated with that new service. Um, and allows them to connect better to the, to the silver line. And so that should augment any of these uh, reductions that they will, they will see in our operating assistance allocation. Uh, GLPC and Lynchburg, we're projecting a 1% decrease. Um, and this is uh, mainly due to Liberty Service disappearing over the past, or being discontinued over the past few years. It didn't disappear. Liberty University took over its own service. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that led to reduced expenses, ridership, hours, and miles, all of the metrics that go into the operating formula. Um, I will note here, though, doing a little bit of the math behind the scenes, the allocation that we're projecting in here still equals 26.5% of their audited expenses, which is nearly the 30% cap. So even with all of those things happening, they're still almost getting the max value that they could. So they're still faring very, fairly well in this, even though they've lost all that service. Uh, Farmville area bus, uh, I mentioned a moment ago, operating expenses decreased over, uh, over the, the period of time between the two audits, um, but they're still reaching their 30% cap in here, so they're still faring well. Uh, and then radar as well, they lost uh, rough up timing service, it was de uh, discontinued, which again reduces expenses, ridership, hours, and miles, all of the metrics, but they're still reaching their 30% cap in here, which means that their expenses went down, so they get a lower amount based on their max value. Um, and so, yeah, that's the last of my slides, and I'll pause there for questions. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I'm happy to go back to any of the other slides if you want to look at anything. It's not really a question, but I think it's more of a statement. So, I think when you sort of look at a projection for the 25 this year, and then change the CRE, um, if I understood the slide correctly, 2.5% is coming out of the operating funds, but that may or may not all be allocated to VRE, but what is not allocated, if it is all allocated, goes back to the capital side, if I read that correctly. So I think that's something to consider. We will see a 2.5% decrease or adjustment out of the operating fund that does not come back if it wasn't completely allocated, where under this formula, that's within the operating formula, it's being redistributed. 
some of the logic from the drafting perspective with that is that the operating program we're now year three is hitting a 30% cap. Where we are coming up short potentially um, based on demand is in the cap program. That's why the, the language that's put in there to redirect anything that was wasn't utilized for VRE, the capital, and the same if, if we hit the 50% cap ever on the WMATA side is the capital. If that's the part of the program where we see the greatest fluctuation in need year over year, and right now we're seeing the greatest increase in demand for funding out of, out of the program. I, I'm not in, into the capital applications like I have been in the past, but you know, our, our requests continue to outpace the number of capital. To your point, we haven't done the FY25 projection. Yeah. No, that's why I said it's more of a statement. Uh, yeah, we, we, get nervous and, we get nervous <laughs> enough presenting projected FY24 based on an incomplete data set. I, I, I can't even think about yeah, it. No. And I thought that it's more of a statement for a future meeting to look at the year. Any other questions for Dan? Or, um. I guess the small clarification on the Lowndes County one, does the TRIP grant that equal or is it still a loss sort of, I don't know what the dollar amount of the trip grant is. But. It was significant and they're probably coming out uh, better off with the trip grant than they would have just with the operating. So it could be off here in the numbers, but I thought the trip grant was for roughly $7 million over five years. Okay. And I think their projected loss in terms of dollars was, I mean, it was less than a million dollars a year. A year. So. So they, that should, should sustain them for this 24, okay. It should sustain them for, for the next right. few years. Yeah. Right. And the trip grant is also a step down. So they get 80% in year one, and then it gradually decreases. So that would even help Loudoun County even more for this one year. And the logic of the trip program is that builds ridership, which then feeds into this one. Yeah. And then they recover. Yeah, so that's helpful. And then the other three are getting to their cap even with the changes. So it's the transition year from DRE that is really the system that has the most significant impact that's on this slide. But yeah. understand. Thanks. And that's why 25 and forward. That's potential will not be an issue. And I think, you know, I was comparing that to my favorite scatter grant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, I think this. This group had a lot of conversations back in 2018, <laughs> <laughs> okay. and you know, square peg round hole. Like this is not a this is not a pandemic ridership driven conversation. This is really a conversation started in 2018 of trying to make VRE fit in a formula that's really not designed for them. And I think what we we had we had to deal with here and. It was the time was right, and that we were very fortunate to have the support of the administration to be able to advance the legislative proposal. So I, I'm very sensitive, and in, in, in all of the people that we talked to in the session, this is not a pandemic-driven problem. This was a mm -hmm. structural problem with the program that's going back to 2018. Yeah. So what the legislation does talk about performance-based allocations for VRE. With a ceiling, what is the process for developing those performance measures? Uh, so those performance metrics will be developed and included in CCD policy that will be presented hopefully in July. Developed for whom? They'll be developed by DRPK. And we'll do that. We'll, we'll you know, work cooperatively with DRE and mm -hmm. how that's done. But, I mean, obviously they're the only two-year rail operator in the Commonwealth. And so we have a, you know, code requirement that we have a performance-driven formula. And so, trying to figure out how you, you know, how you benchmark them from a performance perspective is, is something that we've actually been talking about since we drafted the legislation. So, it's something that we're continuing to kick around. Um, so, there's nobody here to benchmark them against. Do you benchmark them against, you know, and they're trying. some other, yeah, some other entity in the Commonwealth that's similar? Do you benchmark them against other similar commuter rail systems in the country? Those are some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, we just want to make sure it's fair um, and it's fair to everybody else that they have some performance accountability piece 
but it's also fair to DRE that we've given them something where they can be successful and, and show mm -hmm. what they've done. Two things. I'm going to come back to that one, but the first thing I was wanting to just make sure I understand on slide nine, it talks about FY21 DRE allocation is 13.4 million, and then when we get to slide 11, of course we don't have FY24, it goes to 25, and that's 16.3, so a three million increase. Are you referring to this slide? I have yeah. this slide in right now. Uh, the numbers are all messed up. Yeah. So this is the one you want to do? With. Yeah, so I was kind of comparing one footnote says, you know, 13 point something, and this is 16.3. So I was just trying to understand that dollar amount change. So we, for 13, so 13.4 is what we allocated in fiscal year 21. We did basically look back over five years yeah. in trying to figure out the average because the capital asked very year every year to come up with something that was fair. Um, I, not to lay too much out on the table, but we started with a different percentage. DRE came with a different percentage, and so we negotiated and landed at 3.5. So yeah, I remember the averaging piece when we last. I was just trying to get context. Thank you. Um, and then for the VRE. Um, performance metrics. Of course, we've had in TESDAC a lot of discussion on performance metrics. And so the legislation says PRPP and VRE. I was just wondering if TESDAC has a role, would you advise sort of any thoughts for TESDAC or not, you know? The TESDAC by code is the capital form yep. of the operating form. By code, TESDAC does not have a role right. in establishing these metrics. They didn't have a role in establishing the metro. Um, program guidance and policy, and so we're taking the same approach. We, I'm happy to, when we get to the end and talk about what our next steps are with CISAC, we can certainly come back and, and brief you, but I think our responsibility is to work with VRE and commissions that own VRE uh, to <laughs> work on those with the Commonwealth Education Board. That's, that's probably the best way to do it and get it, get it done. And that was sort of my expectation. Mm -hmm. I just wanted it to be clear and yeah. Put it out publicly so we know. Taking the same approach we did with the WMATA policy. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? We okay. care Open discussion? Is there any open discussion? Are you writing the speech? Yeah. Do you need a movie? I guess I've got a question. So, oh, well, go ahead. Please. No, go ahead. I was literally in the process sort of like, when do we come back again? Like, I mean, we did have a pandemic between before and after, and so now, are we now another three years out, or so I can't remember what our process is. Yeah, let me, um, I'm probably the historian, well, Neil's, Neil's really the historian. <laughs> I, I will, I'll be the TISAC historian for now. Um, so we have a code requirement to meet at least once a year. Um, we have a C2B policy requirement that after we get through each six-year program cycle that we would sit back, kind of look at the outcomes and do that. We've done that each year, even through the pandemic. I know. You yep. did. We did. I, I missed all of you. I, I, yeah, <laughs> that talks to my box uh, to you guys uh, a lot. So I think from a procedural perspective, this meeting was kind of the one that was a bit of the one-off that made the commitment to come back. Uh, to do this before we took the draft picture program board. So, in my mind, and Zach and Grant, you guys correct me if this isn't where you want to go, but that we would come back to you once we have the, the six year program done and we would have that conversation we have every year where we talk about what we got in terms of applications, how the process works, bring you any recommendations for tweaks and changes. We just fulfilled that every three year full program review with you guys last year. So, we would need to come back and do that check-in this, I will say, summer, summer, uh, June is, uh, we would need to do that, but other than that, that should be the only activity for TISAC this year, and then we'll pick up, so we'll go back to our one meeting a year kind of thing until we get three years down the road and go back through the cycle again. We'll have somebody else to do this. <laughs> <laughs> So, in all seriousness, Brian said I said that last. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
you kind of give us an update on what's happening with Ramada and how uh, that plays into all this? Um, so, in terms of how Ramada plays into this, when we went through the um, the changes to the program with the 46 and a half percent that comes mm -hmm. out of the program and goes to NVTC for WMATA, that is that is it from us from uh, from a funding perspective, that, the dedicated capital and the PREA funding, that's our commitment from a funding perspective. So the other ongoing dialogue with, you know, like this is, this is, the, the funding challenges, the structural funding challenges for operating with the product, that, I mean, that's, and she doesn't speak to that better. The state doesn't have a role in that. We are actually playing, if I could, we are actually playing a very active role. Um, we have a, a standing WMATA committee at NBTC. Um, that's been around for just a handful of years. Um, and so we do a lot of focus conversations. This year we plan on doing some deep dive on some financial revenue options that could work in the Commonwealth to help fill that gap. It's an analytical exercise that we'd like to have providing information out to when there becomes a political and policy conversation. So that's one thing we have. That's going to be going on this calendar year. Um, we're actually, um, as of today, are putting out a, a request for bids um, for consulting support for that. So that's one thing. The second thing is we're in the process of updating our value of Metro Rail, or actually value of Northern Virginia Transit, to the Commonwealth. Um, we did a study, and that's the economic value um, of gen uh, revenues that come to the Commonwealth and get distributed across the state. If you recall, back in 2017, we did that work. It was approximately 600 million a year. We're getting some preliminary estimates that have made that a larger number. So we're going to be excited to get that out and briefing that again over the next couple of months. So again, talking about what it means about the economic engine of having a healthy transit system in Northern Virginia. So we have a couple of different things at play. A lot of it um, is this year is doing a lot of homework and background and having a lot of conversations with our partners in D.C. and Maryland as to what that looks like. So, um, so there's a lot of activity, probably more so in the past. I know the Commonwealth played a very big role four or five years ago. We're kind of taking on that role a little bit more so when it comes to the operating side of things. So let's chat. <laughs> now, Ray, that is part of that going to be uh, another push to get the federal government to be more active in paying for operating expenses and how that ties into the whole need of getting workers back into the office and how that impacts on that argument. Yes, so there's a couple of different elements at play there. Obviously, the getting back to work as a use of transit benefits. There is, a, as you know, there's a big conversation board of trade and other places for that. Um, there is also, I mean, there are conversations, um, and this is a little bit more on the WMATA side of things, but Ma WMATA has joined other large federal, uh, other large transit systems in the country to be working on directed operating assistance for those larger systems that are continuing. I do not know the status of that. I'm actually going to be connecting on that. Um, so I know that Mr. Clark um, has joined some of his colleagues from places like Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, et cetera, to be working on that lobbying type of effort in Congress for outside of transit benefits and people coming back on ridership, but is there anything historically other than COVID relief that has not been a place where the federal government has played. So it is probably a big lift, especially given the political dynamics, but that doesn't mean they're not asking. So. And what about the issue, uh, I gather there's some discussion about WMATA taking over bus service for the region. Where is well, that's actually in this, and I've talked to Mr. Clark about that. That's actually a, a misunderstanding. They do always look just like we do strategically about how bus is serving, yeah. um, and they are doing their bus network redesign right now. So I believe that they're focusing on what, what WMATA should do, but there's a recognition of the value and the role of the local. So I've actually had that conversation with Mr. Clark, mm -hmm. um, and that may have been an urban myth that was floated out there. And that bus redesign, I will I will go back to the La Hood, the mm -hmm. 2017 La Hood study that redesign and taking that look that they're doing now, the strategic planning requirements were all an outgrowth of that effort that was led here in Virginia. Yeah, and it's participating in that bus redesign because I don't have an operating system, Romata is mine, but at the table, we've got connector and dash yep. and everything. So we're looking at how they play together and not overlap, but, uh, or synergy. But yeah, it wasn't a takeover. No. It somehow kind of grew out of it. Yeah, and so that's, again, glad you said it because it's important for people to understand, you know, WMATA is going to be looking strategically at how WMATA 
should be providing the service. We are also then doing a Northern Virginia look at the transit strategic plans of the systems in Northern Virginia, overlaying it with what WMATA is doing and looking again, how is bus serving Northern Virginia sort of regardless of who the provider is. So those activities are actually happening at the same time. So we're working with WMATA, they're learning from us. Um, and so we're gonna have a better picture of opportunities and challenges and even maybe some joint procurement types of things that go on in Northern Virginia, so. Yeah, but it, it, the reason I raise it is that it, the message that we send and what we talk about is really important, especially as we're trying to build support. Uh, and so that's why I wanna make it clear that the, what's being discussed and what's real, what's not. Mm -hmm. Also the question of whether or not WMATA is looking at maybe if it needs to be right-sized in order going forward, uh, given the financial cliff that supposedly is coming up, should they, uh, your discussion is going to include looking at that as well, and especially if we're going to be asking for more money for operators. Yeah, obviously, I mean, we're working with WMATA, they've got their bus never redesigned right now, so we've got, they're working through that, so part of that is no, an impact. No, I'm just bus, I'm just saying in general. Oh, sure, yeah. oh, sure, of course. Yeah. Yes, us that fund will model will need to be looking at that funding gap that comes up. Yeah, so, and I will say that we are here engaged in all of those efforts as well from state perspective. Um, Clark has come down twice now and met with the secretary. Uh, so, you know, we have a we have a really good dialogue, very positive dialogue um, going on between the administration and WMATA as well. And I think the the changes that were made in the legislation that went through this session relative to WMATA, and we're done in partnership with them and having having Randy be able to, look, there's nobody that tells WMATA's story better than Randy Clark. And, you know, to have him be able to stand up on the Commonwealth Transportation Board and talk about what his vision is and what they're doing, I, I think it's going to go a long ways to have having a more transparent relationship uh, between WMATA and, and the CTB, and it's a big number that comes out of our budget, comes out of our program, and goes to WMATA, and I think our board members, and I'll speak for Dr. Smoot, but like our board members have an expectation that they're going to have an understanding of how that's being, even though it's directed by code, how that's being utilized. And, you know, we, we're following through on our responsibilities by code, of, you know, the accountability that comes with that additional funding that came in 2018. But I, I think that transparency and that open dialogue is going to be so important. And Randy's really, like, <laughs> has done a fantastic job right out the gate of doing that really with everybody and, and kind of opening the doors to WMATA and saying, oh, let's all work together to make this better. And I know I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other uh, comments from open discussion before we move into this public hearing? Seeing none, then let me go ahead and open the public hearing this morning and ask if we have anybody who wishes to speak. Mary Olivia, are you going to? Yeah. Okay. I'll just make sure that everybody can hear since you're yeah. in the corner. So, so TISDAC has an annual requirement by code to hold a public hearing. So we're meeting that requirement today, and if anybody that is watching online wants to uh, make a comment today or to speak in the public hearing, if you will raise your hand, uh, Mary Olivia can unmute you, or you, can they unmute themselves? Okay. If you will raise your hand or you will communicate with Mary Olivia that you want to speak, she will unmute you and let you speak. Everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Going once, twice. Yeah. It's your turn. <laughs> Second that. <laughs> and uh, now we'll go on to uh, next steps. So I guess I'll present this slide. Um, this is just uh, kind of a closeout um, slide for us. Um, so we've already talked about some of this. Um, the SIP, the draft SIP uh, for FY24 will be presented to the CTB in April. Um, it will include our draft operating assistance allocations. Um, so we will be done by then and it'll be out there in the public domain. 
Uh, but we also wanted to just give uh, this group just a heads up on um, the applications that we received for the other programs. Um, so you can see kind of a summary here of our capital applications that we received in the table in the bottom left corner. Um, so the total number of applications or, or line items rather um, that we received were uh, under the capital program were 434 for a total cost of $340 million. The state request was $136 million. Um, so we're working through that prioritization process right now. Um, and then just quickly on the right, um, our technical assistance program, uh, we received 31 applications. Uh, this was the highest number of TA applications that we've ever received. Um, so we're, uh, we're working through those applications right now. Uh, our demonstration grant program, we received 12. That's much higher than usual. Um, workforce development, uh, which is a bit of a rebrand of the intern program that we used to offer. We're now broadening it a little bit to be more focused on workforce development. We got nine applications. Again, that's way more than we usually get. And then TRIP, uh, we received three applications, which is about average uh, for the few times that we've uh, offered the TRIP program. So, um, so those are the, the highlights in terms of applications. Um, one item that I want to just bring forward to this group was when we will reconvene next. I put April here. It might need to be May or June instead, um, just based on the timing of the SIP. Uh, we obviously want to present the SIP, uh, the draft SIP to this group. Um, but I guess I'll just kind of throw that out there. We need to figure out when the group's going to reconvene. Right, if it's not April. Say <laughs> yeah. local government folks do not like April because that's budget budget season, and and I I don't think there's a I mean it's, it's up to you if you want to see the six year program in draft form or if you want to have a dialogue. Once I I think we've done it both ways where we've tried to to have a conversation about it when it's draft, but we've also done it after the final um, in June and July if, if we look back. So I, I think that's really up to up to you. Um, as a committee to determine what works best for you. I don't know that it makes a difference to us. I think we could also potentially do it virtually, right? Because we have the one in person. I think you're right. If I will be available vir virtually. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I will not be here. <laughs> About virtual or in person? Yes, and uh, April versus. Uh, oh man! <laughs> but I'm I don't want April because I think I've got to do nine public hearings all over the state in April and uh, a bunch of other stuff. So. Well, then let's look at May then. Yeah. May twelfth can really be the rest of May is not like the one day. I'm just gonna put that out there. <laughs> May twelfth, not even. On your workforce development, I, how are you, uh, if at all, impacted by the new organization and? How does, does that play out in the whole? In Which reorganization? The workforce, workforce development. About the creation of the new department. No, 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 no. Just renamed it. Yeah, not at all. It's just a this reason. is like where we get fellows that come in from graduate schools and come and work with us. I'm sure that's what it'll can, can you briefly touch on what changed from an eligibility perspective? Yeah, so previously the intern program, it was more focused on like planning interns or fellows uh, or um, office-related uh, internships, um, noticing what's going on in the industry uh, in terms of workforce uh, shortages for drivers and mechanics and all that, uh, we felt that uh, we still wanted to include those interns, those office interns as eligible, but we also wanted to fold in potential apprenticeships for mechanics or supervisors or drivers or call center uh, staff, just kind of broadening it so it's not just like desk jobs, essentially. So we just, we rebranded it to be workforce development, not intern. It still has those uh, eligibility uh, parameters, but we just kind of brought it. Okay, well, I missed that because they're going to be going through the whole implementation process and figure out how they're going to get it done. I was just curious. If that's it. Not involved. Okay. I, I, will, I will mention one more thing on TRIP. Uh, small number of applications each we trip has functioned differently than the rest of our programs i think we've done a couple of mid-cycle uh 
is out of cycle application periods for TRIP, where we see, generally see a lot more applications come in. Those programs with the changes to the code again this year for TRIP, I would anticipate that we'll also do another mid cycle solicitation for TRIP with the new eligibility by code. So we'll just throw that out there that there's a lot more to come on TRIP as we continue to work. I mean, that, that program got launched at probably the worst possible time for a program like that. And so it's trying to find its way. Uh, and so we'll, we'll continue to, to work on that um, by updating the board policy and then putting out a mid-cycle solicitation again. Any other questions? Any? Uh, question in the meeting comment. Um, for the capital, I was just curious, any uh, differences or changes that you saw in the breakout? One, the total, but just between the other categories? Um, the kick on, I actually missed part of the question. Is it? Uh, this was kind of curious on the capital, what change of applications you may have saw. The changes compared to previous years? A uh, little maybe, but more in just the sub About typical. Yeah, it's about typical. So um, I usually look at this in terms of amount of money asked for, not the number of applications or line items, to like as a scale of the program. And this, for the five years that we've run this program, this is the second largest ask that we've had. It's not nearly as high as it was in 2022, which was a really, or FY22 rather, which was really a watershed year for us. Um, but this is uh, slightly higher than, than, than other years. And I think it, it ties to our, our uh, capital projections moving forward as well, increasing needs over time. And I'll just point out, first of all, um, it says major enhancement, that's a typo, it should say major expansion. Um, that category kind of skews all the data. So some years we might get a really large project um, comes in asking for state funding and it just kind of tips the scales. Um, this year we did receive a pretty large one. Um, so that's why you see a $32 million state request. I think that that's a little high compared to usual, um, but um, yeah, that's kind of the, the variable is that major expansion category. Yeah, that's a good point. For scale, I usually just hear the state of good repair and minor because those major ones are just so, such outliers. Yeah, with a lot of our discussion, I was just curious how that played out and being more than just in time and so forth. Yes, yeah, so there are more applicants uh, coming in for replacements earlier in their in their life cycle for vehicles. Yep. Um, so there's always that. And we also have new bus contracts. I'm trying to think we haven't been back here since so we had some economic analysis done on cost and the impact of inflation that I presented to the House Appropriations and a Joint Committee of House Appropriations and House Transportation back in the fall. And we've seen incredible cost increases on our vehicle procurement, um, ranging from an increase of 30% to an increase of, of almost 80% for some of the smaller vehicles, and then a longer period of time for those um, vehicles to arrive. I, we're also starting to see some of that now that our contracts are done and all of that is now a known quantity. Those costs for those replacement vehicles are going to be, you know, so our numbers in terms of how many how many requests we have might be the same. The cost of, of doing business and the cost of replacing those vehicles has gone up considerably. Um, same thing with any kind of vertical construction. Um, so we, you know, if that's something that's interesting to you, we can, we can share that, that information. That was something that um, we did jointly. We were asked to do jointly with CDOT um, and, and share that with the appropriation. So. Then, Chair, for the meeting, I definitely spoke for no earlier than May. <laughs> <laughs> Love May 12th because it's after May 8th when we adopt our budget. <laughs> but, <laughs> but other than that, I, I think at this point, since we've already spoken on terms of what we want for criteria and all that's going to go into the the SIP. So I'm fine seeing it after CCB. I am not available on May 12th. I'll be riding a train somewhere that day. <laughs> I'm like, I missed them too much. So May 12th. May 19th. And I'm also, day. And since we met in person today and seeing everybody, I'm also fine doing virtual. Yeah. <clears throat>
plant for 9 to 12 and work to get done a lot quicker, so we will have been driving more than the time we spent together with you all. You don't want to see us in person again? <laughs> Not that. It's the driving. It's the driving part to a transit meeting that always gets me. We can get you on the train. <laughs> yeah. We have to adjust our meeting time to get you on the train. Yes, you would have to adjust to the... I would love <laughs> well, we were talking about the cost, but did you want to look at that as a date, or should we kind of? I I just looked at my calendar. I'm out, but the 12th and the 19th. We'll we'll. You can do get, a doodle poll. We can do a doodle poll. Yeah. I think it also could be June if we're going to do it after. Sure. My calendar yeah. may just be a week after. Anything else for the uh, the order? Okay. Hearing nothing. Hearing nothing. Okay. Thank you.